Welcome everyone to the latest edition of Talking Data. I'm your host, Kristen Radish with Arbor Research and Trading, joined today by our presenters, Jim Bianco and Alex Miletus of Bianco Research. Welcome to both of you. Thanks for having us. Thank you. Today, Jim and Alex will both be discussing stable coins. The crypto world last week was very rattled because stable coins were anything but stable. Jim, to start us off today, why are stable coins so important? Why do we have them? Yeah, so let me set the stage for what we were going to discuss in this podcast. We're going to assume that the listener here is not deep into the crypto rabbit hole and is trying to understand what happened last week from a very high level and not getting into a forensic analysis of how the UST coin and the Luna coin blew up. There's plenty of other people that have done that. Um, so we're going to answer the question, why are they so important? Uh, the simple answer is a safe asset needs to be in the crypto space. Fiat currency, U.S. dollars, is not allowed in crypto. So if I own cryptocurrencies and I have a pessimistic view of cryptocurrencies, what do I do? Well, I could short them on some of the protocols. They do have futures contracts. You short them. That's complicated. and That's next, next level stuff. But what I would really like is a safe asset, somewhere where I can go ride out the storm. Now I could do that by sending all my money straight back to um, fiat currencies, like in my Coinbase account or my Gemini account or my Binance US account. But when you do that, you incur an immediate tax liability. If that coin you bought a couple of years ago was worth practically zero, and you made a lot of money on it, and you thought it was going to go down in price, you're, you're going to have to get taxed on it, and it gets taxed as ordinary income. There is no capital gains on um, a cryptocurrency. So if you're in the highest tax bracket, you have to give away a third of your profits uh, to the government. But I'd like a place where I can hide. So we need safe assets. So that's the basic thing. And that's where stable coins have come, is what's safer than anything that mimics the US dollar is, is the big reason why I think that safe assets are very important in this space. And what is the purpose? Yeah, so um, that could be best answered by looking at my shirt, right? Because my shirt is showing the history of money and the last one, the little blue diamond is Ethereum and that it might become money. We're trying to use these as a replacement for money. When you buy Apple computer on the New York Stock Exchange, you pay roughly $140 for it, $140. You don't pay 3.6 shares of Microsoft. They don't quote it as an Apple Microsoft um, um, cross or an Apple Google cross or an Apple Amazon cross. <laughs> you, you, you trade it in dollars. You could trade it as a cross, but that means it's three times harder. You have to have an opinion about Apple. You have to have an opinion about Microsoft. And then you have to have an opinion about the relative speed at which the two are going to move against each other. It makes it infinitely more difficult. So in the, in the crypto space, it's the same thing. I have an opinion about Ethereum, which is right there. I think it's going to go up or I think it's going to go down. Is it going to go up or down faster than Bitcoin? Well, you know, uh, and what's my opinion on Bitcoin? I don't know. I have an opinion about Ethereum. So I would like to trade it as in dollars, as the, the, the roughly $2,050 is where it's trading at right now. So a stable coin is a representation of a dollar so that in your pair trade, one part of your pair trade is stable. It just, it's always one or should be always very, very close to one. And then you allow the other one to, to fluctuate. So what I'm arguing here, before we get into the, uh, the different types, which is where we're gonna go next, is stable coins are an absolute critical part of the crypto universe. This is why everybody kills themselves to try and get a stable coin and a stable coin that works properly. Because if you do, you can vastly expand the crypto universe. If you don't, if you go without stable coins, 
then the, you've severely limited the crypto universe. Everybody wants to buy Bitcoin, has to trade it with Ethereum. Or everybody wants to buy, uh, buy Ethereum, has to trade it with Bitcoin or backward or forward. Or you have to trade it with US dollars in your regulated account and every single trade is a taxable event that must be reported separately. And believe me, it is an unbelievable bear. I did my taxes and my, my crypto form ran, I think, 28 pages. And I don't do a lot of trading, but there is a, there is, it is in, enormous. And so, therefore, you want to go into the space and you want to stay in the space. And when you come back to the, 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 the fiat world, you pay taxes on the net difference as opposed to on every little transaction. It'll just you know, overwhelm you. So that's why I think these stable coins are such an integral part of, what, of, of the whole crypto space and why they matter so much. And what are the different kinds that exist? Yeah, so we actually have a really interesting flow chart here from Spencer Noon. Uh, so really there's two different types of stable coins. Custodial, which you can think of as centralized coins here, those are coins that are backed by assets in the real world, say a fiat currency. Uh, they can either be held 100% uh, in dollars in a reserve currency in a fiat, or they can be fractional, held by a, a basket of assets. And then you have the non-custodial stable coins, which are decentralized, right? And there's a couple different types, and all, the differences are really important. So you have exogenous collateral, going in a, in a different order here, you have exogenous collateral, which are coins that are backed by other assets. DAI is a great example. It's backed by Ethereum. Then you have implicit collateral, which is an algorithmic stable coin. There are a couple different uh, examples of these, and they're growing in size daily. And then the endogenous collateral are are coins that are backed by an asset that's created to act as collateral for a specific stable coin. So this is exactly what Terra or UST and Luna, which was a coin that uh, you had said blown up last week. That's the system that it was based on. So let me jump in here real quick and let's go to the, 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 the chart that we have. And let me make a quick word about decentralized and centralized stablecoins. So the custodial stablecoins, that's Circle, that's Tether. You know, so they put a dollar in a bank account and then they issue a dollar's worth of stablecoins. The problem with this is twofold. One, they're subject to censoring that US, USDC or Circle has famously blacklisted a certain number of accounts you could see them on chain, which ones they are. You don't know whose they are and you don't know why. They will not allow any of their USDC to be withdrawn to accounts that have Russian internet protocol addresses. So they, they put rules on this. Um, remember in the crypto space, the idea here is money is supposed to be private property, not a public good. And so, if, so with a centralized coin, you wind up having it. Uh, you wind up having it being permissioned, and you turn it back into public good. So the decentralized coins, and that's what we're looking at now. This is the holy grail of the financial system, uh, or of the crypto system, excuse me. Because if you could create a coin that cannot be regulated, cannot be permissioned, that will hold its peg one for one to the U.S. dollar then you've got something that could expand orders of magnitude. Because the second part is that regulators will never allow stable coins, centralized stable coins like a USDC or a Tether to go into the several hundred billion or trillion dollar range. They fear someday everybody's going to want out and they're all going to run with their Tethers in their circles back and say, give me a dollar. And then if there's several hundred billion or a trillion dollars of this stuff outstanding, they might be backed by a trillion dollars worth of treasury bills. They would have to sell a trillion dollars worth of treasury bills immediately, and they would create havoc in the traditional markets. So they're going to really throttle the growth of those centralized coins. The decentralized coins 
is where everybody's putting their effort in trying to find a better mousetrap on the decentralized coins. So we could go back to the flow chart, Alex, and um, you could um, uh, continue uh, where we were. Is there anything else you wanted to add about the, these uh, stable coins? Yeah, and it's something that you had uh, alluded to a little bit there, that these non-custodial or decentralized coins are really going to act as a catalyst for growth in the decentralized finance space, right? These coins, these stable coins, are used as collateral to loan, to borrow, and that's really important as the value that is added to crypto and added to decentralized finance expands. The, the use of these stable coins is essential to that growth. Yeah, I, I completely agree. See, without stable coins, you can't have DeFi. DeFi is the, the parallel financial system. So if these endogenous coins, the, if we go back to the chart again, and you look at uh, the chart one more time, you'll see that uh, they took a big hit because of the of the UST liquidation. They went from, what was it, Alex, $32 billion down to $11 billion in a week. Yes, and the exactly. bottom chart shows you that their, their, their trading volume was over a billion dollars a day. Is, is what they've been trading in the last week or so on the bottom panel. So if this area of stable coins is defunct, that these algorithmic, these crypto backed stable coins are, are no longer going to be able to be used, you're severely limiting the ability of DeFi to grow. Uh, now, there is one version of these, if we go back to the flowchart again, uh, there is one version of these, and that is the uh, uh, the Dai stablecoin. But the problem with Dai is, in order to use it, you take one dollar forty worth of other cryptocurrencies like Ethereum, and you stick it into a you stick it into a smart contract, and they give you one dollar of Dai. Then you can because it's collateralized now. Then you could take that one dollar of die and you could go out and you can lend against it, you could borrow against it, uh, you can lever yourself, or you can earn interest. You know, when you're done with it, you could put the one dollar back and you could take your original coins back, provided, of course, the price doesn't fall, because then you get a margin call and you're liquidated out of that. Die is fantastic. It has been around for years. It has survived last week. It has survived everything without barely a blip. But it's not very capital efficient. I need a dollar forty to get one dollars worth of die. So can die become a trillion dollar market? Probably not. So this is the challenge that the crypto space has. It needs a safe asset. Another option for a safe asset would be a central bank digital currency. Problem with the central bank digital currency is again the same thing. Um, does this uh, central bank want to? you know, encourage the growth of the of the DeFi and of the crypto space? I think the answer is no, they really don't. They see it as a competition. So are they going to allow a future digital currency that they issue to be able to be used in the crypto space as that $1 safe asset marker? Probably not. I'd like to say that they could. They still run into permissioning problems with that too, but at least they could. you could vastly uh, expand that. Alex, do you got any concluding thoughts on this? No, I think you hit, a, you hit a lot of the important points, especially the need for a safe asset in crypto. I think that's one of the most important problems that stablecoins are trying to solve here. Yeah, exactly. And the, and the motivation for this podcast, of course, was I've been reading a lot of people saying, why do stablecoins exist? Why don't they just go away? I think they're not appreciating the role that they, that they fill and other people say, why is everybody killing themselves to make a stable coin that, or make a cryptocurrency that never moves in price because of the importance of it? And you can also use it as an instrument uh, for earning interest. Now, in the theory, you know, so you, by the way, you, the way you earn interest is you, you put it out of you put it out and you earn an interest rate. If somebody borrows it, which is leveraging their positions, they pay the interest. It flows back to you as the staker in, in that equation. So given last week, what should be, we be watching for next? I'll, I'll go first on that. I think what we got to watch is the remaining, you know, non-custodial or decentralized stable coins. DAI, FRAX, FRAY, 
MIM, which is, I think, terribly named magic internet money because it plays up into every stereotype that everybody wants to say about this space, but they actually named it that. How do these coins behave in the wake of what happened last week? Do people start to lose confidence in any one of those coins? And do we see anybody trying to run for the exit? So far, the answer is no. The only stable coin that seems to have wobbled at all in the last week has been Tether. Uh, and it regained its peg quite, quite rapidly. So how do these coins behave? That's going to be the big question. Alex, you got any concluding thoughts? Yeah, I think that's a great one. I think the other really important thing is to see how these coins are going to be used in the future. Are they are people going to stop using these as collateral and start to use other crypto assets or or does this wobble or break as we saw last week? Does confidence still remain? Are we going to be using stable coins in the future? Is someone going to create a coin that that works properly? I think that's the most important thing. Uh, to be looking for. Yeah, and the big in the big use case for all these coins, once you get one where it can scale, you have confidence that it's created properly, that it won't lose its peg. You could then use it in real world payments. You exactly. can start buying stuff with these coins. One of the reasons that that's not really happened yet is because of what happened last week. Now, it's very possible that the answer is, at least now, none of these coins and none of these incantations will actually work. Um, you know, it's, it, somebody once said, it's kind of like in the 17th century, when we were trying to discover flight, we always knew that there was a way that man could achieve flight. It's just we hadn't quite figured it out yet. And maybe this is what the case is now, is that we're, we're figuring out all the ways we can't do it. And maybe there's still a, a way left that we can do it to figure out. And that's to be determined. But the purpose of this is, again, to understand why they exist and why they are so important. Well, thank you both for your thoughts today. And thank you, everyone, for joining us. As a reminder, we are client-driven. If you have any questions at all, please let us know. You can contact us by emailing Gus Handler at gus.handler at arborresearch.com. Thanks, everyone, and have a great day.